My name is Marlene Westervelt. I've had a long-standing interest in salt. Um, for those of you who know me, um, you will have heard about it, but I met the um, people behind SALT, um, John Miller and Anne Nockertz, back in 1999 when I did my master's degree at Canterbury University. So um, I'm not saying I know everything about SALT and um, that I'll be able to answer all your questions, but I'm definitely very enthusiastic about this software program. So let's get started. Um, a brief overview. Um, we're going to talk about just briefly about um, why language sampling, sampling and analysis. Um, I'm just assuming you wouldn't be here if you weren't interested or um, already doing that. So I'm not going to go into too much detail. Um, a little bit about what is SALT. Um, I'm not sure if you've got the program, whether you've seen it, whether you're using it. Um, I haven't asked you to put those details in and it doesn't matter. I just want to give you an overview of why I think it's such a useful program um, for clinical practice. I'm going to compare it briefly to Sugar and Clan. So they, those are two other um, freely available software programs that you can use for analyzing your language samples. So hopefully you'll be able to make a little bit of an um, informed decision about that. And then about choosing the sampling context. And again, um, each of those topics could be a full workshop in themselves, but I've promised um, it won't take longer than an hour and I'm hoping to keep the presentation to 30 to 40 minutes. So there is some time for questions afterwards. Um, we're definitely going to get into the SALT conventions and a refresher. I've put in some quizzes in between that sort of to test your own knowledge and hopefully um, if you feel you can answer those questions then you know you're on your way to become a salt whiz um, and then as I said there'll be questions and answers at the end. I am going to release the slides um, so what I'll do is for all of for those of you who are attending today I'll send you a copy to the recording and I'll make sure that I upload the slides somewhere haven't released them beforehand because it sort of gives away the answers to the quizzes and I don't think that's much fun. Um, you may disagree with me there, but that's um, what I've done. I can hear one microphone going, so um, I think I might just um, mute that one. I've got the controls today, I can tell you. All right, so why language sample analysis? Um, I've put in lots of questions because really, why you're doing it in clinical practice may depend on the question that you're asking. You may want to determine what the child's performance is at simply at word and sentence level. And I'm talking about, you know, semantics, um, morphological markers, or um, at sentence level, maybe utterance formulation or syntactic ability. The other reason could be to determine performance at discourse level. And I'm thinking about conversation, narrative, expository, or persuasion. So we have lots of different choices to make when we conduct language sample analysis. Um, we may want to use language sample analysis to set goals for intervention and or assist in monitoring progress over time, right? You may want to compare the results of your language sample analysis to typical peers um, at word, sentence, or discourse level. And then you may want to use that to confirm, sometimes refute, sometimes complement your standardized test results. For example, the ones you got from the TILS or the SELF-5, um, so the Clinical Evaluation of Language Fundamentals. And then finally, and I'm sure there are way more reasons than this, but it's to create performance reports for reporting back to family, teachers or other professionals. So, for some of those, you may need um, some computerized analysis. For some of them, um, you won't need it. And as we teach our students at, um, you know, our master's level, uh, master's um, program at Griffith University, and I'm sure it's the same across Australia and the world, um, it's hypothesis-driven assessment and it's hypothesis-driven analysis as well. We don't want to waste our time because there's so little of it. So what is SALT then? And I will come back to those questions, hey, throughout the presentation, because some of the analyses will be perfect for some of answering some of the questions and other, other analyses or programs will be better at answering other questions. So basically, um, systematic analysis of language transcripts is a software that, as you can see on their website, it standardizes the process of eliciting, transcribing and analyzing 
um, language samples. And then it includes a transcription editor. We'll talk about that. It includes standard reports, very handy, but also reference databases. And I'll come back to that because reference databases we can use to compare our client's performance to the performance of their typically developing peers. Um, it was developed in the 1980s, so about 20 years before I met these wonderful people. And their mission is really to improve the assessment of language acquisition and disorders by developing easy to use software with comparison data from typically um, developing speakers. So that easy to use, I thought I'd highlight that because we often hear that people don't do language sample analysis because A, it's time consuming and B, it's hard to learn how to use certain software programs that may potentially save us time when doing the analysis. I'm making lots of assumptions here and if you don't agree with me, feel free to put it in the chat box. Okay, so what about coding? Let's hit the panic button here, because that's a comment I often often get, like, oh my goodness, how do, how do we do that? Um, well, let's think about what we mean by coding, because it's definitely not what you see in front of you, right? You'll need to transcribe your sample. That's just the way it is. And I'll come back to that and I'll show you some of the um, technological advances that we've seen in, in recent years you'll need to segment your utterances because that will affect your mean length of utterance calculation. Now, again, that shouldn't be too difficult because um, that's what we normally do, right, in clinical practice. You need to identify bound morphemes. And you think, oh my goodness, for, for those of you like me who've done your um, degree a long time ago and you're not really into bound morphemes, um, that may sound harder than it is. Um, and I'll go, go through those in details, but you may not have to, and we'll come back to that as well, because depending on the age and stage of um, your client and whether you're interested in actually determining whether they use certain bound morphemes as opposed to others, you may not need to code them. You know, we don't want to be coding them or um, counting them if we're not gonna use it um, for intervention or intervention planning purposes. Um, we want to identify um, repetitions, unfinished utterances and reformulations to get a sense of um, children's utterance formulation difficulties and their ability to plan. You know, it, it tells us a little bit about cognitive load. We may want to identify pauses or not. If you're not interested, let's not code them. Let's not waste time on that. And then we may want to identify errors at word and sentence level. And again, I've put or not, because sometimes by year three or four of schooling, actually errors at word and sentence level aren't really what affects this child's communicative um, uh, ability to get the message across. Okay. So really, I think, if you agree with me that that looks like an okay list, then let's keep going because that's what it's all about. All right, so let's briefly then, before we get into some of these conventions, let's compare SALT to CLAN. And you can download CLAN from um, this particular website address. And as I said, I will be um, making sure that you have access to the slides. Now, CLAN is fantastic. It computes those measures across 49 languages. Now, SALT, um, and I'll, I've got a slide comparing them, um, the three software programs in a little bit more detail. Um, but really, SALT is mainly for English. Um, it also now has some capacity for Spanish, absolutely. And I think it's being used with, um, don't quote me on this, but French and or Turkish but definitely not across 49 languages. Um, CLAN doesn't ask you to manually code morphemes. That sounds good. Um, it does require your coding. And by coding, I basically mean identifying, hey. It does ask you to um, code for repetitions, fillers, intelligible segments, and abandoned utterances or grammatical errors. So that's not automatic. Um, you can link it to audio and or video. Now, that is an amazing feature. Um, I've done it once. Um, I'm not sure if you always need that in clinical practice. So again, that's just one of those considerations. 
Um, and they do have some published measures available for mean length of utterance and for number of different words. And um, we'll talk about number of different words. It's a good indicator of a child's expressive vocabulary um, below the age of six. Um, and then if we think about sugar, and that's a quite a recent um, development, and it does stand for something. I'm sure it's a bit of a pun on salt, but it stands for, I don't know, I can't remember. But it's a protocol. Um, again, you can download it from that website. It's free. And you use Microsoft Word. There's really minimal coding required, although you still need to identify those morphemes. So you're really not going to get away from that unless you use CLAN. That's pretty um, accurate in doing so. Um, you have to, um, you sort of omit your filler word repetition of formulation. So you don't actually transcribe those in, in sugar. And um, we may come back to that later, why sometimes it's actually really good to know how many of those filler words are in there. Um, there are no procedures for error coding. That's not what this um, protocol is about. Um, and there are some comparison data for conversation samples between three and seven years of age. So really then, the type of software program you use would be um, dependent on your um, language sample analysis question. Um, it depends on the types of measures you're interested in. Like, do you just want to know what the child's mean length of utterance is, for example? Do you want to know about the child's number of different words, um, grammatical errors? Do you want to know about the child's speaking rate, perhaps? Verbal fluency? turn taking so that's that discourse level measure in in conversation um, and the list goes on and we will definitely in our webinar series we will start addressing those different measures and when some measures might be better to use um, than others it really depends then also on the depth of your planned analysis like what kind of information do you really want to get out of your um, language sample may depend on the age of your clients, um, because some of those um, databases are only available for, um, or those comparison data in the other programs are only available for younger children. Um, also, it depends on the intelligibility of your client. If the child you work with is really very difficult to understand, and we sort of use a rule of thumb as um, 70%, then there is not much point in um, transcribing the language sample because then there's going to be too much guesswork and we're then not quite sure what we're measuring. I'm not saying don't do it at all, but it may not be the best use of your time. Um, depends on your discourse context as well. If you're just interested in a simple um, conversational sample or a play sample, um, and I'll come back to that because the, the beauty of SALT is, of course, that there are lots of different protocols that have been embedded in SALT. Um, and it depends on whether you want to simply describe your child's language performance or whether you want to do that comparison to typical speakers. So let's look at comparing to typical speakers and what do those three different programs actually do for us? So... Um, this is from a, a paper that has just been published by um, these people, Pezold, Imgrund and Holly Storkel, um, and it's freely available. It's an open access article. So I have kindly borrowed some of their fantastic, very useful um, little tables to show you. So basically what it says, this is just comparison of the database features. So this will tell you once you've analyzed it for certain features, um, what can you do from a comparison point of view? And of course, um, comparing is sometimes nice because if a, if a child has an MLU of five, how do you know if that's within normal limits or not, unless you compare it to typically developing speakers? So as you can see here, they've looked at age and you can see that CLAN is really up to um, five years of age if you want to compare. SALT goes um, up to adolescence. And sugar is really from three till about seven years of age. The types of samples, there's a big difference there as well. CLAN is really around play samples, 
um, that are much more appropriate, of course, for younger children. SALT really goes across different um, database um, discourse contexts. And SUGAR has one particular protocol that they've done quite a bit of research in. So it's definitely worth um, checking out. Then, um, as I said before, languages. So um, they all do English. Um, SALT has bilingual English or Spanish and Spanish as well. So definitely much more targeted for the um, US market. Um, and then we look at the cost and of course, um, Clan and Sugar are free. Um, but then going back one step, looking at the analysis features. So this is not just, can we compare it to a database, but also what types of measures may we get? If we look at MLU, they all give us measures of MLU and the M, little m is in morphemes or not. Um, this is the, the clauses per sentence, so it gives us a little bit more information about um, how many dependent clauses, how complex the child sentences are. Um, salt and sugar both do that, but clan doesn't. Um, type token ratio, I'm going to come back to that um, probably in the next webinar. Um, that basically means how many, um, it divides the um, total number of different words by the total number of words. It's very, very dependent on the length of your sample. And um, like I said, we've all come back to that. It's not a good measure to use. But if we compared it, um, clan and salt both do it. And sugar, it's the only um, semantic measure that they um, come up with, that they give you. Amazing behavior, I'm going to come back to that. I keep saying that, but I will, I promise. Amazing is really those reformulations and um, fillers and um, fluency type behaviors. SALT does that. Gramma grammatical accuracy, SALT does that. Examiner behavior, CLAN will look at turns. SALT will give you lots and lots of different measures um, and SUGAR doesn't. So we can think about some of the questions again we want answered but some of that may just relate to analysis and some to comparison. So then if we look at the cost, the cost to buy salt is um, for a clinical license, not a student license, it's 209 US dollars. I don't make up that price, but compared to a lot of other standardized tests we may buy or um, equip when we may purchase, um, it seems to be um, pretty good value for money. But like I said, I don't set the price on this. So just then remember, before we get into um, the next, um, some of the coding, <laughs> um, students with language disorders are not alike. So I copied this straight from um, John Miller's, um, one of John Miller's papers. And that really then depends on the types of measures you want to um, collect, right? And I, I'm sure I'm preaching here to the converted again, but I just thought if I, if I put this on a slide, we could refer back to it. So for example, if your child has a so-called general developmental delay, we may be really interested in, um, well, to confirm our hypothesis, a low mean length of utterance. And we want to look at the number of different words to look at their um, expressive vocabulary. We want to look at the total words, like how many words do they use? And we may want to look at their words per minute, because we know that some kids who have this sort of global developmental delay aren't very good at initiating conversation and aren't very good at responding and maybe quite slow in that respect. Some of our clients will have specific word finding and utterance formulation problems and um, they will have display a high number of repetitions and revisions at word or phrase level. Sometimes that is to sort of find a particular word to use um, and they may use particular um, strategies, of course, for finding that word. Some kids will use that circumlocution, so they'll start describing it until they get to the thermometer that I wanted to talk about. Some of them may use some phonological um, strategies and come up with other words that sound very similar but don't. So if you have concerns, if your hypothesis is around that word finding, then you would want to look at the child's amazing behavior, for example. Um, other kids really have discourse deficits. They may have trouble maintaining their topic and failure to respond to examiner questions, for example. And in that 
if we um, have concerns about that, we would want to look at the language sample and we would look at their um, response to questions, for example, or we would want to see whether the child initiates conversation or how much talking the child does. So really look at more at discourse level in a conversational context. Um, and then we have slow speaking rate, we may have fast speaking rate with very low semantic contents. Um, I won't keep um, reading all this out. And then there's disordered language with a high percentage of errors and omissions. So really then, when we get to choose all the different measures, and that is definitely for webinar number two, um, we may want to consider measures of fluency, um, macro structure, especially with those kids who struggle getting a good coherent story out. We may want to look at articulation um, and sometimes, of course, um, written language. And that's another feature. We're not going to go into much detail um, in, you know, written language, but that's another feature that SALT can help you analyze. So that's why um, Miller and his colleagues say, if it's done properly, it can really be a standardized assessment, not necessarily a norm referenced assessment, but definitely standardized. So just a brief example, I'm not going to read this out. So if we think about coding, what does it look like? Um, so again, this is straight out of this beautiful article that you can download. Um, here it shows you one line where the child says, and sometimes um, whenever it's time for us to put them in bed, we put the horse in here. So this is how you would do that in clan. This is how you would do that in salt. So this is the child. And this is how you would do that in sugar. So that is what we mean by coding. It's just what sort of brackets do we use? What sort of little identifiers do we use? Okay, so how long does all this take? And again, thank you to um, Pezzled and her colleagues. They did a, a quick study about that. And they said, look, um, CLAN takes um, five, uh, five to 11 minutes. And um, I can't quite remember how long their conversation sample was, but it was a preschool conversation sample. And um, SALTS took five to 15 minutes and SUGAR only got took two to four minutes. So that might be a much quicker way if you're only interested in those particular measures. Um, what is interesting here is that 11 to 17 percent of utterances with coding disagreements, that's too high. We seriously, when I, I've done lots of research in this area, we never have disagreements that are that high. So that was another reason for just running um, a few webinars because Basically, that needs to be low. It needs to be five to 10%, if not lower, if we all agree on some simple um, coding conventions. Okay, so choosing the elicitation context then, I'm just gonna um, move on quickly. Um, choosing the elicitation context is also important because again, we don't wanna start transcribing this long sample and then decide, oh, I shouldn't have chosen that because then you'd be wasting your time, obviously. Um, so it depends on the child's mean length of utterance, just roughly speaking. If the child has a mean length of utterance that is below three, so only three words, one or two words in a sentence, then you may be better off transcribing that um, live online, right? And then you may be better off just analyzing that for, for example, semantic categories. Um, as I said before, the child's intelligibility, um, 70 to 80 percent is, is what we use as a general rule of thumb. And then there's the child's age. And we want to consider what is the best possible elicitation context that may get the most complex language from the child, but is still in a context that is relevant to this child's everyday um, functioning. And that's why I've put here child's context whether that's the best word, whether at home, school or community, right? Um, so we want to make sure that we elicit a language sample in a context um, to get really further information about the child's functioning 
in an in a context that he is likely to use on a daily basis so that if you decide to use that for intervention that you can then monitor progress and that that will hopefully generalize to the child's everyday functioning um, and again of course it depends on the reason for eliciting the sample so i've put on that slide with those six different reasons um, the child's goals why is he or she there to see you um, the speech pathologist um, your planned analysis, as I said, it's this hypothesis driven um, assessment and analysis um, procedure and then definitely the availability of norms um, or benchmarks. So I've done lots of research um, into um, slightly changing the context to see what it does to the child's language output and it is amazing. If you give the child two different stories and one story is um, twice as long as the other story and you ask the child to retell, well, not surprisingly, the child is more likely to give you a longer story if the model story was longer. But the other things that really um, were very, very interesting is the model story is more complex, so it uses longer sentences, more different words and more complex utterances. The child's language is very likely to be more complex. So you really need to be careful if you want to um, compare it to norms or to benchmarks, I should call them, then choose one that we have benchmarks for. Because once you've elicited a story, I'm just using that as an example, with one book, you really cannot compare it to the norms or the benchmarks we have um, for children who used a different book. So that's what I mean by that last um, remark. So transcription, just a few quick pointers here. Um, you could try these different ones. Um, we've been trying the first one. It's, um, it's a transcription service by Azure, Microsoft. It's free. Um, and what we do now is I just um, put it in. You have to change it to an MP3, whatever. It's pretty good. It probably saves half the time in transcribing it. You'd still have to, to code it and check. Um, especially if kids have a strong accent or a speech sound disorder, it may not always be very um, accurate. Um, there is Otter. Otter has a free service and you can also subscribe. Um, some actually clinicians tell me they dictate a child sample into that particular dictation.io. So they listen to the child sample, then they just say it back. Um, because you don't necessarily need to transcribe the child's speech sound disorders, of course. Um, you can send it to SALT, you'd have to pay for that, um, or use your students. Um, a lot of the different universities now are teaching SALT, so it's very good practice for them and it might save you a little bit of time. So a rough guide, um, recommended language sample context by age, again from this same article. Um, so really then a play context for the, the early school years or the early preschool years. Um, conversation with an adult um, can be from preschool to elementary, we would call it primary school, um, story retail or story generation, expository and persuasion. Saying that, we've actually got benchmarks for expository language sample performance um, with kids in the early years of schooling, and we've also done persuasive um, discourse with kids in um, sort of the middle school years. So I think sometimes it's good to give children a context that is quite tricky to really try and demonstrate some of their weaknesses in language performance when we put the system, if you like, under a little bit of stress. All right, so my suggestion then is check why you want to do language sample analysis. Um, do you have access to SALT? You can download a free version, but it only gives you access to 15 utterances. Do you want to compare to typical peers? And if so, really check out the built-in reference databases before collecting your language sample, because you really cannot compare apples to pears. Um, again, I'm not going to run through this now because we will run out of time. Um, and I will send you these slides. Here is the um, link as well. There are lots and lots of built-in reference databases. Some of them have been used specifically with the New Zealand and Australian um, children. And when we get into analyzing language samples and comparing to databases, so that's in webinar two and three, I will go into those in a little bit more detail. 
So let's get into some of that coding. And there'll be a quiz after each section to check your knowledge. So uptrend segmentation. Why, um, why do we have to do that? Well, why we have to do that is basically if we don't all segment utterances in the same way, we would all end up with different mean length of utterance, right? Because um, what we use as communication units, it's a very um, dry, easy to replicate method. Um, and it doesn't always follow the child's speaking um, manner. So the child may be speaking without even stopping. We all know those kids. Uh, we would still segment it as if the child is talking in separate sentences, if that makes sense. Just to make sure that when we're comparing to our databases, that we've done it the same way and that we're not saying, oh, this child is a superstar in MLU, when in fact, um, you haven't segmented them in the same way as we did when we um, developed those databases. So communication units are basically an independent clause with their modifiers. Um, and they can be incomplete, for example, when it's an answer to a question. So let me give you some examples. Consider the examiner says, where did you go? And the child says, I went home and she went to the zoo. So it was just one utterance. But what we would do in SALT is we would segment this into two communication units. So you would get, I went home, full stop, and she went to the zoo, right? That is because, um, and I think that's on my next slide, hint, know your coordinating conjunctions. So look for your coordinating conjunctions. There actually aren't that many, and, but, and so, and check if there's a new subject after that particular conjunction. So as you can see here, I went home and she is a new subject, went to the zoo. And that is when we segmented into two communication units. Okay, there we go. So I went home when she went to school. So try and um, come up with, um, let me just see. Okay, this quiz is on the next slide. Oh no, it's right here. I'm just hiding it with my own, <laughs> with a view of myself. Okay, let's do the first one. I went home when she went to school. Segment it in your head or on a piece of paper and come up with this at one communication unit or two. I'll give you five seconds. Oh, sorry. Ah. I knew I'd stuff that up. Okay, the next one. I went home, but she went to school. How many? I went home to see my sick brother while she went to school. My friend and I went to school. Mum says, I need to eat veggies so I stay healthy. And the last one, I like soccer, so I go every day. All right, so hopefully that wasn't too hard. So here are the answers. So the first one is one. I went home when she went to school. When is a subordinating conjunction. So it's all one utterance. I went home, but she went to school, we would call that two. So we would put a slash, a full stop here and a new utterance, but she went to school. Even though you might think, oh, but the meaning, it goes with it. No, just use the hints. I went home to see my sick brother while she went to school is only one communication unit. Because while is a subordinating conjunction. My friend and I went to school is still only one because my friend and I went is the subject. My friend and I is the subject of this um, utterance. There is no new um, subject in this sentence. Mum says 
I need to eat veggies so I stay healthy. So in this one, it's so that. So that's a subordinating conjunction. And mum says, what? We actually have a whole big dependent clause here. So this child is using lovely complex language. So only one communication unit. And the last one is a bit tricky. I like soccer, so I go every day. That is actually two communication units. It's not so that, it's I like soccer, full stop, so I go every day, right? So if you have any questions about that, put it in the chat box and we'll come back to it. And I'm sure you've seen utterance that are way um, longer than that. Okay, so let's do one more. This one says, where do you go to school? And the child says, Redlands. That's only one communication unit. It's an incomplete grammatical utterance, but it's in response to a question. So we still give the child um, credit for a communication unit. And I'm saying that we've done that in our reference databases. Do you like it? Yeah. Separate the yes, no response from the utterance that follows. Because the child said, yeah, I do. We actually separate them. So we call that two communication units. Why? I hate maths, I guess. Do not separate tag phrases. And then the child has a three second pause. Although I like reading. And consider pause time and intonation. Because there was a clear pause here. Um, even though that is a dependent um, or a subordinate conjunction, we would still put it on a separate line because the child had finished talking and then actually comes up with an afterthought. Last one. He found the boy and he said, I'm ready. And then the boy said, be quiet. So these are sort of embedded dialogue quotes. So again, what you need to do is you just need to separate them into communication units. So don't be afraid of doing that. But then we sometimes have these superstars who give us 33 words and we might be inclined <laughs> to separate them because we think, oh, that's too long, 33 words. But actually, but a little while later, the boy who was afraid of the dark went into the cave that seemed very scary because he had promised his friend he would rescue the baby dragon. So that is one wow utterance of 33 words. Okay, that finishes our utterance segmentation. So how to start utterances and why? So we need to tell the software program who did the talking and what type of utterance um, it was. If you're interested in that kind of information. If you're not interested in finding out whether the examiner asked questions, or not, then you could just add full stops after every utterance. It doesn't matter, you can do that. As long as you put something at the end of the utterance, otherwise the program will tell you that there are actually seg um, segmentation um, or um, what do we call them? Transcript errors, right? So we need to put something at the end. So here um, I've just put pulled out something that was in response to a photo and the examiner said, can you tell me about it? And there's a question mark and the child said, sure. And then we put an equal sign. If you want to capture this kind of information, the child leaves the room, right? It doesn't get analyzed. It's up to you whether you want to put those little ones in. That arrow needs to go with the equal sign. And then we could put in um, utterances, a pauses between utterances. And then we can differentiate between whether it should have been a different person speaking or whether it should have been the same person speaking. Again, if you're not interested in that level of detail, then I suggest you either don't code them at all or you just put in a little colon to indicate there was a pause time here. And we'll talk more about pauses in our second webinar. And that's what I mean, if needed, it's really up to you to decide how much coding do I wanna do. So 
how to end your utterances and why. It's really, again, um, code for the following if you're interested. So if the examiner says, what was it? It's a question. And if you're interested in how many questions were asked or answered, then definitely code them for question marks. Here the examiner says it was, a, so it's like one of those closed questions, like fill in the gap. It's an intonation prompt. So you can code them like that. Then the child said, I think uh, it's an abandoned utterance. So the child doesn't finish the utterance. And some kids actually are very good at not finishing their utterances, which might give you some information about um, the quality of the discourse. But again, if you're not interested in it, you don't have to. Why did you, and then the child interrupted and said, I love it. It's an interrupted utterance and the speaker is interrupted. And this is really, save this one for surprises or exclamations, like, I love it. And the child said, we went to the zoo. So um, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's just a full stop. We don't use full stops, that's what this says, for abbreviations. So for example, if you want to do continued with a full stop in the middle of the sentence, Saul doesn't like it because what it thinks is as soon as you put a full stop, that's the end of that utterance. Okay. Few more codes, easy ones, promise. So sometimes what you may want to do is you may want to put a comment within an utterance. So the examiner said, what have you got? And the child shrugs his shoulders. Or the examiner says, is that a caterpillar? And the child holds up the toy and goes, yes, right? So what we do is we only do that if they're nonverbal with communicative intents. If you only want to know the child's mean length of utterance verbally, then again, you don't have to actually transcribe all that stuff. And sometimes, of course, if you weren't there um, collecting the sample, that may be quite difficult if you've only got an audio sample. And then what about unintelligible segments? Um, what we do is we use a big X for words. We use a couple of X's for segments and triple X's for an utterance. So if the child says, I love, and you think, oh, listen to it three times. I have no idea what the child said. Then you just put an X. I went to tum -tum. What? <laughs> two X's or the child said, oh, the other ones. I have no idea, but you may still want to capture that the child did some talking. Um, typically, when you use salt to analyze your sample, we would actually exclude these segments from analysis because it's really going to be hard to guess what the child actually said um, if it was unintelligible. So it will give you some measures to say how many of the child's utterances were intelligible. Okay. So let's move on to mazes, um, for example. <laughs> and what we do is we put those in brackets. So mazes are really, I hadn't heard of mazes until I, I met John Miller, um, but mazes are basically our filled pauses, our false starts, our repetitions and reformulations. And we all use those some of the time, if not a lot. They can be, um, what did I do? Oh, hmm, I can't remember. It's that kind of fluff <laughs> that you may want to capture when you're transcribing the language samples. So if we're doing that, if we're going to put brackets around it, then we want to combine adjacent mazes, right? So if the child said, he, 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 he went to the zoo, then we really want to put all the he's together in one big long maze bracket. We want to assume that the child's last attempt is what he or she said. So that's an interesting one because kids sometimes correct themselves, but it's actually more incorrect the second time than it was the first time, right? But this is not a written sample. So what we do is we put the first attempt in those big mazing brackets and then we leave out the second attempt. And if there's an error in there, we would code it with an error and we'll come to that. 
um, we can't nest mazes. So what that means is that, um, let me just make sure I'm not jumping the gun here. So we can't nest mazes. That means you can't do double brackets everywhere because the program just simply doesn't like that. Um, and what happens if you put those brackets in when you take um, those words that are in the brackets out of the sentence, the utterance can stand alone, right? So what's left then is what the child hopefully meant to say in the first place. And what's in the mazes doesn't count towards the mean length of utterance. So it's really important that you get that mazing right, because um, if there are lots of ums, 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 the salt program will just think, oh, it's three more words. <laughs> but really, they're not words. And it may indicate utterance formulation difficulties, um, be a measure of formulation load, for example, when they're planning to tell their stories and it's really tricky, or it could be an indicator of fluency problems. So if we look at the sentence at the bottom of this um, screen, he um, went, to, went to the market to buy a book from his lovely, oh no, old lady, what we would do is we would put the following brackets around it. Ooh, oh, hang on. I've jumped the gun again. Okay. It's your turn. <laughs> I almost showed you the example. So if we had to do that, how would we actually um, code that? So what I'm going to do is give you five seconds in your head to think which words would you put in brackets to end up with an utterance that can stand alone. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So what I would do is go he, um, went to, so we put those ones together, went to the market to buy a b book from this lovely, no, old lady. He went to the market to buy a book from this, love, from this old lady. And you may not agree with me. You may think, oh, but lovely is such a nice word. I want to keep that out. Well, actually, once we get to the analysis, if you wanted to look into the, the child, inside the child's mazes, you can do that. But this is our rule of thumb when we're um, looking at mazes. So what about this one? And the monster almost took, and the monster took her into his um, his um cave. How would you do that? So just take a few seconds to put some brackets around this. So I'll give you the arm. And the monster almost took, and the monster took her into his cave, right? So they are a little bit annoying to um, transcribe. Um, and again, like I said, in sugar, they don't do that. But if the child does this a lot, it would really affect the child's um, communication skills or their ability to get their message across. So that's the correct one. Okay, so let's move on. I'm aware it's 10 to 11 um, in Brisbane. So what about coding of morphemes in SALT? So most of SALT's conventions for marking bound morphemes are based on Brown, Mr. Brown, good old Mr. Brown, who I think based it on three to five children. We code most of the inflectional morphemes, but not derivational morphemes. We don't code comparative morphemes like ER and EST, and we don't mark irregulars. Okay. If you want to read up a little bit more on the reasons behind that, then this is actually a very nicely written blog that you can access. But let's come up with some examples and there aren't that many. So we code inflectional morphemes of plural, possessive, third person singular, 
past tense ED, past participle, and progressive tense, past and present progressive tense, right? That's probably as um, detailed as we go in most of our SALT analyses. So for those of you who did last during that training, um, this is probably as, as um, detailed as it gets. Although we do do contractions as well, because they are definitely um, a sign of developmental um, progress. So we have negation, is R and M, so they are your um, copulas or auxiliaries, will and would, future tense indicators, have, has or had, does or did, and us, right? So this is that little list that you may have to come across. Now, actually, when we come to analysis in SALT, it, there is actually a help feature that will help you run through your transcript and ask you to make decisions. So it's not as if you have to do that completely um, based on a, a, an uncoded transcript. We don't mark irregular forms or plurals that don't have a singular form, like geese, for example. Okay. So again, um, code them if needed. If you're, not, if you're not concerned about it, usually if the children are nine or 10, I actually don't even code bound morphemes. And I just simply tally mean length of utterance in words because that's what I'm interested in. And I'm more interested in the child's use of complex sentences and dependent clauses than I am in, in the kind of errors they make, right? So for example, regular plural, I like eggs. Do not code irregular forms, so look at the leaves, or I love geese. Possessive is a Z, daddy's shoes, plural. Do not code possessive pronouns like his, his shoes. I should have put a, actually a slash S there for the plural. Third person singular, put a three in front of it, otherwise salt thinks it's plural. He likes daddy's shoes. <laughs> and then we can combine plural and possessives the baby's toy versus the baby's toy. So here we had two babies who had a toy and here we have one baby who had a toy. Okay, now you're ready. A few more. Regular past tense. I liked him or he bored me. But watch out. Don't code he was bored or he was scared. Right, because that is not a regular past tense ED. And that is a mistake that we often get um, with our students in particular. We code ING for present or past progressive. I am swimming, where are you going? But watch out, we don't do I love swimming when it's a gerund, for example, or swimming is my fave. So watch out for that um, auxiliary verb of to be. And that will actually tell you whether it's a progressive form, um, ing of the verb. And then past participle, he has taken my bike, but watch out because he has seen or spoken or been isn't actually a past participle. And what you may have noticed in my examples is that in front of that little slash that we use to indicate our bound morphemes, we just put the root of the word swim and we get rid of that double M. We get the root of the word take and we add an E. And that is really when we're looking at the child's number of different words, we don't want to give them credit for tech if you didn't put that E there for take and then take as being two different words. And then contractions, um, I thought I would put them all on the slide. So when you get the slides and you get to doing some transcriptions, um, you can um, just refer back to them. Again, they aren't that hard. We just want to know, I can't do that. He doesn't know me because it definitely shows a good progression in the child's use of um, um, linguistic skills, I suppose. We don't do irregular ones or when the sound of the root changes. So don't do that. We actually don't, <laughs> don't slash that one or he won't do that. So will, won't, we just leave it as is and there's different ways of tallying it. And these are just some examples of how we do contracted forms for will, am, I'll see you on Sunday, I've had a nice day, she's so mean, you're the best. 
he'd do it if he could. So this one is for would. He would do it if he could. Be careful, hey, because make sure you add that little apostrophe. Otherwise, if you did he's without that little apostrophe, Saul just thinks it's a plural S. And then the last ones here is about he or he's been sick. We'd better go and let us go. Again, if you're not interested in capturing that, don't worry about it. Just transcribe it as a full word. That's fine. But during those early stages when we have children with um, developmental language disorder, those are the kind of things that I really struggle with. And if we want to monitor progress after intervention, for example, then it's really nice to capture um, those skills. So let's test your knowledge. So this is our quiz and I've made it multiple choice, A, B or C. So how would you code he likes me? So I'm just going to give you, ooh, we're going to run five minutes over time, I'm afraid. Okay. Hope I haven't put you off because we're going fast. But like I said, you can go back through it. So let's look at the answers. And um, for those of you who've attended today and have to leave now, I will definitely send you the recording. Okay, he likes me is third person singular. So the answer is A. If you put a Z, it's a possessive. If you put an S, it's a plural. I walked the dog is Past tense, ED, regular. I'd love to, I'm just going to give the answers because I think some people are desperate to see them just before they um, leave. I'd love to go swimming. It's just a contraction. I'd love to go swimming. And we've left swimming there because that is actually not a present or progressive. Uh, that's not a progressive form of ING. We tied the dogs to the tree. This is actually past tense ED. Multiple dogs. Not a possessive. He's my best friend's brother. And that's the last one. He is my best friend's. We've got a possessive and then brother. All right. The shame I can't see how you went, but hopefully this makes sense. So for those of you who want to come to the second one, I've just posted it. I've just got a few chat questions coming through. I've posted it on um, the last slide. And also if you go back to Eventbrite, um, it'll be there and I'll send you all an email with the details. And the next one will be shorter. I just wanted to set the scene and I sort of slightly underestimated the time. Okay, so what if the child omits words? So you code omissions with an asterisk, and I've got three or four more slides to go. You code omissions with an asterisk. So if the child omitted that um, contraction, then you put a little asterisk there to say, it should have been there, but it wasn't. He's my best friend. Or if the child omitted the whole word and it should have been there, he's my best friend and the child says he's best friend, then that's how you code that. If we have the next one, he's going home and it's definitely an omitted, omitted bound morpheme, then we put an asterisk to say it should have been an ING. It's brilliant for a progress monitoring um, because it's an obligatory context, the child omitted it and we can then see after intervention or maybe six months time uh, whether a child is now including them. And then the last one, he wants to go. This word was left unfinished. We don't know if the child wanted to say wants. Maybe it's a word, error, um, a word finding problem. Maybe it's a fluency problem. Who knows? 
but we've simply indicated with little asterisks. Okay, last section, word and utterance errors. So there are only a few words that we use to mark errors in our reference database samples. And here I've put some examples on this slide. Um, and I'm going to go to the next slide. This is straight from um, the book. So just watch the use of spaces. If you use an error at word level, there's no space between this code and error and the word. If it's at utterance level, you just put an um, a space between the word and the code so that the program knows, ah, you're not just talking about one word, you're talking about the whole utterance. So I'm going to give you some examples. Overgeneralization, for example, he goed, he should have said went, home. So note there is no space between the word and the code here. Um, what we do do, and again, you don't have to, you can indicate what the root of the word is with this um, vertical slash that's actually above your enter key and um, to indicate that the child should have said go. Again, you don't have to. If you're just interested in the error, overgeneralization error, then just go for that. That's absolutely fine. Pronoun errors, kids are very good at doing those. Um, me like biscuits, it should have been I. It's helpful if you put down what it should have been, because once we come to our analysis section next time, you will get a beautiful list of the types of errors the child made. And then you can decide whether that is something that you want to target in intervention or not. Then we have word errors, general ones. She go should have been went. You could have, if that was out of the context, you know that it should have been third person singular instead of past tense, you could have coded that as a omitted, obligatory, third person singular bound morphing. Then we can go to home. That word shouldn't have been there. So you just simply code it as a little error at word level and you don't have to put anything else. And um, some kids are very good at putting those little words in. And then at utterance level, for example, she not do anymore. So this is where we put that space. Um, and you could put in a lot of different words there to make up the sentence, but you'd just be guessing. So it's much better just code it as an error at utterance level. So, okay, test your knowledge. Last one. Which one would you choose, A or B? Me love swimming. We might just go to them, through them one by one. Okay, so that's A. I love swimming. If the child had said me am swimming, then that would have been a progressive ing, but it's not. So you were probably focused on your me, <laughs> um, but it's definitely an error at pronoun level. What about the next one? I'm not go there no more. I would code it as A, an error at utterance level. You could potentially choose for B, and this is where sometimes we will end up with some disagreements. I do not go there anymore, but basically what you're doing is you're trying to come up with words that the child didn't use. If there's only two of those kind of errors, then you could potentially do that. As soon as you start putting in more than two words, I would definitely go for safe and go for error at utterance level. When we come to our analysis, you will see how that might affect your analysis. He comes to visit me last night. How would you code that? So that's definitely B. So it's an overgeneralization error and the child should have said came. We can identify the root with our vertical slash. It should have been come. Let's go to mummy home.
So we would code that as B because the child says, let us go to mummies. It should have been a possessive S. And then I'm the best transcriber ever. And that's the second one. We actually don't um, use those ERs um, because transcriber is just a noun and it's definitely a contracted um, um, M, so copula. Awesome. I hope you did all right on this. So where to go for more for now? Like SALT actually provides a lot of free training, self-paced online training ones. Um, to cover any of this in more detail is, um, I recommend that 1300 series, their transcription online courses. So you just sign up, it's for free. You download them for free. You have to order them, but it's all absolutely free. Um, our second webinar will be on Friday, the 19th of March. I promise that will be a little bit shorter because we don't we'll, won't have that preamble. Um, I've just put the next one up. So you just go to webinar two salt. Again, I will send you that link in an email as well. And we will definitely start looking at analyzing. So that's where the fun begins really. And interpreting the results. So questions or comments, um, I'm going to post this webinar and other questions and comments that come through um, on my e-learning site um, tab on my website. Um, there's also a Google form that you can use to post questions. I had one quick question um, about the use of um, access to indicate unintelligible segments. And that is actually, um, if you're the one eliciting the language sample and the child is difficult to understand, yes, I would definitely recommend you repeating what the child said, because often um, at the time of eliciting the sample, you know what the child said. So you're doing that little bit of translation without trying to sort of disrupt or interrupt the child's flow of thought. So yeah, that's absolutely a fantastic um, tip or trick. All right, I'm well aware